This is uh, our sermon series on the life and work of Jesus. This is part nine. The uh, scripture passage for this morning is from the Gospel according to Mark in chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. You'll remember last time Jesus had gone across the lake to the Gentile side of the lake, the area of the ten cities, where he healed a demoniac. So at the end of that adventure is when this starts. And when Jesus had crossed back in the boat, to the other side of the lake, a crowd gathered about him. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, Jairus by name, came to Jesus and seeing him, fell at his feet. And Jairus begged him, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And Jesus went with him. Just a few words about the synagogue. In the early history of Israel, the temple was the most important place to worship and in some ways the only place to worship. And worship consisted primarily of making sacrifices. But after the Israelites were taken off into exile, the temple was knocked down and destroyed. So they had to develop an alternative way of worship. So they based their new worship upon studying the works of Moses, and the words of the prophets and the writings that were collected as psalms and proverbs and, and stuff like that. So the synagogue as we see it uh, in Jesus' time was a lot like what we have now as a church. I mean, their worship was different in form, it was differently shaped, but this was what they developed for worship that didn't play, take place at the temple, for worship that didn't make offerings upon an altar. Um, and since the early Christians were Jews, uh, our early churches imitated the way the uh, synagogue worked. The synagogue might hire a rabbi, a teacher, uh, to teach the law, but the synagogue itself was run by its own elders. And uh, this is what Jairus is, not, not a rabbi, but one of the elders or leaders of the synagogue in the town that he's in. I wonder sometimes if it was frustrating for Jesus that he didn't get leaders from the synagogues coming to him and asking him to preach. Um, preaching is actually what he was there for, but the only times we see him preaching in synagogues is when he goes to visit in a new place, and the first time he's there, they may give him a chance to speak, and he may say something, but here in Capernaum and in the other cities where he was regularly known, after that first time, he wasn't welcome to preach in the synagogues. His message was at some odds to their message. And was it frustrating for him that people who wouldn't invite him to come and preach would come to him and beg him for the life of their child? It sometimes seems as if people's belief in Jesus's power to heal was as if it were a magical power rather than an integral accompaniment to his preaching and saving work. You don't have to necessarily listen to and believe what he's preaching and teaching in order to ask him to save your little girl. I think that must have been, in some ways, frustrating to Jesus too. But I am sure also that we all understand the desperation of the parents of this little girl. Let's keep in mind, however, that the death of children was much more common in those days somewhere between one-fourth and one-half of all children who were born alive died by the time that they were 12, what with accidents and childhood diseases. And the deaths of babies and very young children was so common that it, except for the brute grief, it was almost taken for granted. This one may be more poignant, though, um, as we'll see in a couple of sentences down the story. This girl was 12. She'd survived already the usual round of childhood diseases. Her parents had good hope that she would grow up and have a family of her own someday. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman in the crowd who had had a flow of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, 
but kept growing worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said to herself, If I touch even his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the hemorrhage ceased, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Now we've seen these crowds following Jesus before. We should remember that in many cases, 50 or 60 people constituted a crowd. Most of the towns and villages where Jesus did his work, at least early in his ministry, were between two and 6,000 in population, not huge, as best as we can tell. And even the big city of Jerusalem was between 30 and 60,000, not much more than that. We do have reports in the Gospels that on one or two occasions when Jesus was preaching out in the countryside and people had come from all around, that there were between four and 10,000 people present at one time. But here, even if this is Capernaum, one of the larger towns here, a crowd thronging about him is probably only several hundred at the best because only two or 3,000 people live here. Now this woman with uh, the flow of blood, uh, probably some sort of cancer in the reproductive organs, I would guess. This woman and her healing, um, I preached about this before. I did a whole sermon just about this story, so I'm not going to do everything again. But I want to call to attention a few points because they lead to the overall point of this sermon. Notice this woman's condition. It's chronic, which is sometimes harder to accept than an acute disease, which either kills you or else you're soon over it. Chronic illness wears down the spirit as well as the body. Chronic illness is the kind of thing that all too often deadens hope and leaves a person depressed. But notice also, this woman too is acting like what Jesus does is magic. She's trying to take advantage of it as though it were magic. She treats him as though he were a sorcerer with magic power in him that could be drawn upon by anyone who knows how. She's not treating him as someone that she could trust to love and care for her. She comes up behind him in the crowd. She doesn't talk to him. She doesn't treat him as someone who would heal her out of concern for her welfare and not just as a showy act of magical power. And this misunderstanding, this treatment of his healings as though they're some sort of magical power is something we see Jesus working against throughout most of his ministry. It's part of the reason why he sometimes tells people not to tell others about the healing that they've gotten. But he also challenges the crowds on their desire for miracles sometimes. The crowds that are fed in the sharing of the lows suffer from this, uh, this way of understanding or misunderstanding Jesus and his power. The crowds that chase after him suffer from it. Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, uh, who was the ruler of Galilee, suffers from it. It says in the Gospel of Luke that Herod had been looking for years for a chance to talk to Jesus and hopefully see him uh, perform some miracle or some great magical act. Um, so I think that this is part of the problem, that these crowds think of Jesus as having some sort of magical healing power, instead of seeing him as who he is, uh, the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel, come to them, and that the healings are incidental to what else is going on. They're an extra. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And Jesus looked around to see who had done it. But the woman knowing what had been done to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. This last thing that Jesus said is the key to this whole passage. This is why he was so diligent to find out who it was who had touched him. This is why he ignored the protests of the disciples. 
he needs to find this woman so that he can correct her misunderstanding and transform her healing from something done by magic to something done by a loving God. He needs to tell her that she was not healed by the hem of his garment or by the power going out of him, but out of trust, out of faith, because of her hope. It's true that she misunderstands at first and doesn't actually have a good, clean, true faith yet when she touches his clothes. It's true that she's still beset by that magical understanding of what Jesus' power is and how it works. But in this moment, and at this time, when the force of her healing is still strong, when her understanding of what had happened is still fresh, it's still able to be molded and shaped, it's at this time that Jesus takes this moment in order to transform her misunderstanding into true faith. But in order to do that, he has to force her to face him. And he has to tell her face to face that it was faith and not magic that healed her. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from Jairus' house and said to Jairus, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But ignoring what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, but trust. And he allowed no one to follow him but Peter and James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a tumult with people wheeling, weeping, and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a tumult and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. This tumult, this uh, people weeping and wailing loudly, this was a custom at the time. It was a device for dealing with grief. Our custom of sterilizing everything to do with death and turning the bodies of our loved ones over to technicians and only going to see them in hushed places, clean, scented, when they've been carefully laid out so they look good. I don't know if they look like they're still alive or just sleeping. They always look dead to me, but at least they look good, and everything's solemn, and it's quiet. This would have seemed very strange to the people of Jesus' time, just as their loud weeping and wailing seemed strange to us. Why are you acting like this? Is some sort of a solemn ceremony, they might ask us. Aren't you hurt? Haven't you lost someone? How can you just stand there and greet people in a low, polite voice? How can you stand not to weep and wail? So this tumult, this was a customary way of dealing with grief in that, their culture. It was not a tumult because all order had been lost and everything had turned chaotic. This was the way they dealt with it. And when Jesus says that the girl is just sleeping, they laughed at him. And one of the things that this shows us is that they took death seriously. They knew the girl was dead. She was dead and gone. If you look into writings in uh, the old books in uh, biblical and uh, early times, you will find that even though they talk about uh, Hades, as the Greeks and Romans did, or uh, Gehenna, uh, as the Hebrews did, they all visualize that as a place where the dead had no real life. They didn't think and feel, they didn't get any pleasure out of life, they were just a sort of a shadow of what they had formerly been. They weren't really alive. The ancient world, generally speaking, took death seriously and believed that when people were dead, they were gone. It was over. There was no way of getting them back. There's a whole bunch of writings in, in the works of the Greeks and the Egyptians and the Romans where it talks about how when someone is gone, they're really gone. The laughter of these people at Jesus when he suggests that the girl is only asleep shows that they took death seriously and they shared the belief of most in the old world that, that the dead were gone that some remnant of them might survive, but, but nothing with the full life that we have here in this world. But Jesus put them all outside. 
and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in to where the child was. And taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately she got up and walked. She was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know about this and told them to give her something to eat. What I want to look at here and what I want us to realize is that faith and hope are not preconditions for these miracles. They are things that are created by these miracles. Faith and hope are creations of God. They're not achievements of us. We don't achieve faith when we make ourselves somehow believe these things. We don't achieve hope when we somehow make ourselves uh, expect and look forward to them and take chances upon them. It is God who acts faithfully. It is God who proves himself trustworthy. We trust God. We believe in God. We have faith in God because of who he is and what he does. God often works to turn our desperation into trust or into hope. These people, Jesus gave them credit for believing, but really they were mostly desperate. Does that amount to faith? Does that amount to hope? They took a chance on Jesus. They'd heard about these things that were happening. But does that amount to trust? Does that amount to faith? I think we have to realize that God gives us credit for better than we could have understood or meant or, or believed. God gives partial credit on this test of faith and hope. C.S. Lewis said something very much like that. And by God accepting it as being better than it is, as being more true and real and, and, and complete than it is, as having greater integrity than it does, when, when God accepts it as faith, he turns it into faith. When God accepts it as hope on our part, he turns it into hope. He takes our broken and inadequate way of approaching him and gives it partial credit and adds his faithfulness and his trustworthiness to it and transforms it so that it becomes good faith and good hope. And this is what I want us to have, the courage to go ahead and even when we know our faith is imperfect and we know that our hope is desperate and hoping against hope because we're, we're afraid that nonetheless, we're willing to take the chance because we trust that God will do more than we deserve, that God will give us more credit than we deserve, that God will strengthen our faith and make it better, even if it's only partial, that God will fulfill our hopes better than we could have hoped because our hope is only partial and desperate. I want us to have courage and willingness to lay before God the needs we really have and not be shy and not hold back and not try to pray to God only for the easy things that might come true, but even for the hard ones. Even if God sometimes says, no, I'm going to let this happen. Um, but we need to know that faith and hope and love are not prior qualifications, which we have to achieve first in order to receive good things from God. Sometimes we accidentally talk as though that were the case, but it's not. Faith and hope and love are things that God is creating in us by the Holy Spirit. The, the beginnings of hope, the beginnings of faith and trust, the beginnings of love that we experience when we reach towards God, those are already a product of God stirring our hearts so that we would seek him. And then as God responds to our our weak efforts, our beginning efforts at hope and love and faith, as God responds to that, he gives us greater ability. He teaches us more. He fills us up with more power and more ability to care and to share and to love and to hope for all things and to love other people even when they're our enemies and to believe in God and have faith in God and trust God 
even when it's easy to doubt him. These are good gifts which God gives us. Amen.